Friday the 28th of June 2019. I'm Steve Towers. Welcome to ITB. Let's get started. France's proposed 3% digital services tax has jumped a major hurdle. A joint committee from the two Houses of Parliament has reached an agreement on the final text for the DST bill. The bill is now scheduled to be voted on by the National Assembly on the 4th of July and by the Senate on the 11th of July. The final text has not yet been released, but a press release has. Importantly, the Senate's proposed sunset clause, under which the tax would expire on the 1st of January 2022, has been dropped. However, there is a remaining concern over the EU state aid risks with the tax, as only one French company is expected to be subject to the tax. For that reason, the final text requires the government to provide its reasons for not formally notifying the European Commission of its intention to implement the tax. Nevertheless, commentators have said that, despite the technical arguments on the state aid issue, it's unlikely that the Commission will take any action against the French DST for the simple reason that the French DST is based on the Commission's proposed model. Meanwhile, across the pond, the complaints are becoming louder. This week, the top two senators on the US Senate Finance Committee wrote to Treasury Secretary Mnuchin urging him to consider all available tools under US law to address the targeted discriminatory taxation under the French DST. And then the letter includes this statement. As you know, the Internal Revenue Code provides tools to address such actions. Under Section 891, a double rate of US tax could be imposed on citizens and corporations of foreign countries engaging in discriminatory taxation of Americans. For a copy of both the French press release and the US Senator's letter, please go to our website or app. The Chinese and US presidents will meet for lunch tomorrow in Osaka on the sidelines of the G20 Leaders Summit, hopefully to agree to relaunch talks to end the trade war. We'll see. And in regard to the common reporting standard, the OECD has released a so-called International Administrative and Operational Framework to support the automatic exchange of information. Also, updated XML schema have been released. For a copy of the OECD's announcement, please go to our website or app. In Australia, the tax authorities have released for public comment draft guidance in regard to the non-concessional MIT income rules, which apply from the 1st of July. Public comments are requested by the 9th of August. For a copy of the draft guidance, please go to our website or app. Also in Australia, the idea of a patent box tax incentive is again being discussed. This time it's been suggested by the country's treasurer, speaking at a conference in London. Commentators have said that something needs to be done in regard to Australia's corporate income tax. 
the country is projected to have the second highest corporate income tax rate for large companies in the OECD next year. In India, the Mumbai Income Tax Appellate Tribunal has decided a PE case under the India-US Treaty. Here are the relevant facts. The taxpayer is a US company. The US company has a 100% subsidiary in India. Both companies conduct diamond grading businesses. The Indian sub entered into contracts with Indian customers to grade diamonds. This is shown as services number one in the diagram. The Indian sub has employees who in many situations have the necessary expertise to perform the customer contracts. However, due to resource constraints and sometimes due to the need for specialist skills, it engages the US company to perform diamond grading activities for it. This is shown as services number two in the diagram. In such cases, the diamonds are transported to the US company in the US for such work to be done. In regard to services number two, the Indian sub pays the US company a fee equal to 90% of the fee it receives from the Indian customer. The Indian tax authorities claimed that the Indian sub's premises constituted a fixed place of business PE in India for the US company under Article 5.1 of the India-US Treaty. The basis for this claim was that the arrangements between the two companies constituted a joint venture. In other words, they were jointly conducting a business in part at the Indian sub's premises. This claim was rejected by the tribunal based on a review of the relevant contracts. The tribunal said this, it is evident that on perusal of the agreements, the transaction of grading services between US Co and India Sub cannot be considered to be in the nature of a joint venture since India Sub has its own independent expertise, but only due to its technology capacity constraints, it forwards the stones to US Co for grading purposes. It is not an arrangement between two parties where each party contributes its share in order to undertake an economic activity, which is subjected to joint control. In fact, the arrangement is akin to an assignment or subcontracting of grading services to US Co. Wherever India Sub does not have the requisite expertise or technology or capacity for carrying out the grading services. And later, the tribunal said, factually, there is no joint venture agreement between US Co and India Sub vis-a-vis -vis gem grading services rendered by US Co to India Sub, since it is India Sub who enters into agreement with the client and bears all the risks, including credit risks, client-facing risks, etc. Also, in terms of the agreement, India Sub bears the risk of loss or damage to articles while in transit to and from US Co, and also during the time when the articles are at or in the US Co's facilities. Therefore, the economic risks of the gem grading services rendered by US Co vis-a-vis -vis stones, diamonds of customers of India Sub shipped to it are borne by India Sub. And hence, there is no joint venture arrangement whatsoever between US Co and India Sub. The tribunal therefore concluded that the US company did not have a fixed place of business PE in India. For a copy of this case, please go to our website or app. In Indonesia, the government has issued a statement indicating that it is considering the introduction of significant tax cuts in selected industrial sectors. According to the statement, 
the government is considering to promote investment in seven industrial sectors, including food and beverage, textiles, automotive and chemicals. Possible options include tax holidays, tax allowances and a reduced corporate income tax rate of 20%, down from the current 25% rate. For a copy of the government statement, please go to our website or app. In Korea, the government has announced a policy framework to develop high value-added services. The policy framework includes tax incentives, including incentives for R&D. However, no details are provided. For a copy of the government statement, please go to our website or app. The European Court of Justice has decided a case on referral from Latvia in regard to the deductive method of determining the customs value for imported goods, in this case, medicines from India. This case was decided under the EU's Community Customs Code, which has now been replaced by the Union Customs Code. However, the relevant rules in regard to the deductive method are substantially the same. The court considered three issues. The definition of similar goods in applying the deductive method, the time limit of 90 days, and the relevance of discounts. The first issue is the definition of similar goods. The court said that factors to assess whether other medicines are similar goods to the imported medicine would include the composition of the medicines, substitutability of their effects, and commercial interchangeability, which would include the relative market position of the goods and the manufacturers. The second issue concerns the time limit of 90 days in which the regulations allow similar goods to be identified. The court held that that time limit must be applied strictly. And the third issue concerns the relevance of discounts which are given for the sale of the imported goods. The court said that such discounts cannot be taken into account when using the deductive method. For a copy of this case, please go to our website or app. And the European Court of Justice has decided a VAT case in regard to the meaning of the phrase vessels used for navigation on the high seas in Article 148 of the VAT Directive. That article provides an exemption from VAT on the supply of such vessels. The relevant vessels in this case were described as self-propelled offshore drilling rigs, which are used in a predominantly stationary manner for the offshore production of hydrocarbons. The court held that the phrase vessels used for navigation on the high seas covers vessels the predominant use of which is travel. Therefore, even though the offshore drilling rigs in this case were mobile and indeed self-propelled, the fact that they were predominantly used in a stationary manner meant that they did not fall within the phrase. And therefore, the VAT exemption was not available. For a copy of this case, please go to our website or app. The European Commission has lost another state aid case. The European General Court yesterday annulled the Commission's 2016 decision that Hungary's advertisement tax breaches the EU state aid rules. The court overturned both grounds on which the Commission's decision was based. The first ground relates to the progressive rate structure of the tax. The court's press release says this. In today's judgment, as regards Hungary's application of the progressive rates at issue, the general court finds in essence 
for the same reasons as those set out in its recent judgment concerning the Polish tax on the retail sector that the Commission was not entitled to infer that there were selective advantages constituting state aid solely from the progressive structure of the advertisement tax. And the second ground relates to the deductibility of carried forward losses. The court's press release says, the general court concludes that the 50% deductibility of the losses carried forward does not entail a discriminatory element contrary to the advertisement tax's objective and accordingly does not constitute a selective advantage characterising state aid. For a copy of both the court's press release and its full decision, please go to our website or app. The European Commission has published a proposal which it supports for the Czech Republic to introduce a generalised reverse charge mechanism from the 1st of January 2020 to the 30th of June 2022. For a copy of this document, please go to our website or app. The Netherlands government is lobbying other EU member states to introduce an aviation tax to reduce carbon emissions. The Dutch government last week hosted a conference on this issue. For the link to the conference website where you'll find all of the conference documents, please go to our website or app. In the Netherlands, the government has announced the establishment of a commission to make recommendations concerning corporate income tax. The recommendations will cover both the broadening of the corporate income tax base and ensuring that the Netherlands remains attractive for head offices of multinationals. The commission has both government and external members. This initiative is described in a letter sent to the lower house of parliament by the state secretary for finance. For a copy of the letter, please go to our website or app. Also in the Netherlands, the government has published a new decree on dividend withholding tax. For a copy of this new decree, please go to our website or app. And finally in the Netherlands, a government agency has issued a discussion paper called Dutch Shell Companies and International Tax Planning. The paper's summary includes this statement. This paper uses the financial statements of special purpose entities, SPEs, for explaining the origin and destination of dividends, interest and royalty flows passing through the Netherlands. We find that Bermuda is the most important destination for royalty flows. These flows come from Ireland, Singapore and the United States. For dividend and interest payments, the geographical pattern is more widespread. We find a substantial tax reduction for royalties by using Dutch SPEs compared to a direct flow between the origin and destination country. However, we cannot find such tax savings for dividends and interest. For a copy of this paper, please go to our website or app. In Norway, the Tax Appeals Board has decided a case concerning the acquisition of a tax loss company. The issue in the case was whether the tax losses were permitted to be used after the change of ownership of the company. Under the Norwegian tax law, the existing tax losses of a company, which has had a change of ownership, can be used only if it can be established that accessing the tax losses was not the predominant motive for the share acquisition. The tax loss company, Company A, was a pharmaceutical startup company with tax losses of 85 million kroner. Based on the Norwegian corporate income tax rate at the time of acquisition, which was 28%, these losses had a value, before discounting, 
of nearly 24 million kroner. All of the shares in Company A were acquired by an unrelated company, Company B, which had a solid position in the pharmaceutical industry. The price for the acquisition was 14.3 million kroner. At the time of the acquisition, Company A's assets included cash and receivables of 11.3 million kroner. It also had IP rights valued at 3 million kroner. The board stated that the significant value of the tax losses, 24 million kroner, relative to the value of the cash and receivables and the IP rights, suggested that accessing the tax losses was Company B's predominant motive for the acquisition. Therefore, the board said that in the circumstances, the onus is on Company B to establish its non-tax motives for making the acquisition. And it concluded that Company B had failed to provide convincing evidence of the significance of such non-tax motives. And so it decided that the tax losses were not available. For a copy of this case, please go to our website or app. Also in Norway, the government has issued a document which proposes amendments to the country's interest limitation rules. For a copy of the government's document, please go to our website or app. In Poland, the government has issued transfer pricing guidance in regard to a number of aspects of comparability analysis. Importantly, the guidance applies only to transactions which occurred on or before the 31st of December 2018. For a copy of the guidance, please go to our website or app. In Slovenia, the government has announced plans to amend the corporate income tax law. Firstly, to introduce a minimum corporate tax at a rate of 7%, and secondly, to increase the corporate income tax rate from 19% to 20%. Both changes are proposed to be effective the 1st of January 2020. In Sweden, the Supreme Administrative Court has decided an interesting transfer pricing case in regard to the application of TNMM. The taxpayer is the producer of absolute vodka and other spirits. It sells those goods to related buy-sell distributors in many countries, including the US. Its US subsidiary prepared its 2007 US transfer pricing documentation using the TNMM method and using three-year averages, 2005, 2006, and 2007. That documentation showed that the US sub's net margin as a percentage of sales exceeded the upper quartile of the comparable set. In other words, the US sub was relatively more profitable than all of the companies included in the comp set. As you would expect, the documentation therefore concluded that the prices charged by the Swedish parent to the US sub were not higher than the arm's length price. And therefore, the arm's length principle was satisfied from a US corporate income tax perspective. Also, as you might expect, the Swedish tax authorities took this USTP documentation as evidence that the prices charged to the US sub were in fact too low and that therefore the arm's length principle was not satisfied from a Swedish perspective. In other words, absolute companies' profits were understated. The taxpayer argued that the 2007 financial results were impacted by an abnormal event which caused US sub to show an abnormally high profit in that year. In order to address that issue, the taxpayer took the position that four-year averages should be used by including the 2008 year. 
The tax authorities disagreed with that approach. The court made two interesting comments, but I should emphasize that these were made in the context that the Swedish tax law places the burden on the tax authorities. They must establish that the proposed transfer pricing adjustment is appropriate under the arm's length principle. The court's first comment is that the tax authorities had not established that the use of four-year averages to lessen the impact of the abnormal 2007 year is inappropriate. In other words, the taxpayer was entitled to use four-year averages. And the court's second comment is that the tax authorities had not established that the comparison should be with the interquartile range in the comp set. In other words, if the taxpayer shows that its results are supported by one or more comparables at any point in the comp set, including the upper quartile, then it has satisfied the arm's length principle. For a copy of this case, please go to our website or app. In Angola, it's been reported that the government has decided that the 1st of October 2019 will be the new implementation date for VAT. In Nigeria, the Court of Appeal has decided a case in regard to the imposition of VAT on inbound telecommunication services. The taxpayer is Vodacom. And this case was an appeal from the decision of the Federal High Court in early 2018. You might remember that I covered that Federal High Court decision in my previous video podcast series. The particular services were satellite provided bandwidth capacity, which was supplied by a non-resident company with no establishment in Nigeria. In 2018, the Federal High Court decided that the services were subject to VAT and that the Nigerian resident service recipient had to account for the VAT by reverse charge. A similar decision was reached by the Federal High Court in the Gazprom case in September 2018. Well, the Court of Appeal has now confirmed the Federal High Court's decision in the Vodacom case. Why is this noteworthy? Well, even though the destination principle, which is what this decision reflects, is considered globally to be the preferred way of imposing VAT on cross-border services, the conventional understanding in Nigeria was that the origin principle applied. Please excuse the pun, but I think this case is destined for the Supreme Court. In South Africa, the tax court has decided a case in regard to the most favoured nation provision in respect of dividends in the South Africa-Netherlands Treaty. If this sounds familiar, you're right. It's the reverse situation which was considered by the Netherlands Supreme Court in January this year. You'll remember that I covered that case in ITB on the 25th of January. Here are the facts. A Netherlands company held a greater than 10% shareholding in a South African company. The South African company paid a dividend to the Netherlands company. Under the South Africa-Netherlands Treaty, the dividend withholding tax rate is prima facie 5%. However, under the MFN provision, which was introduced into the treaty by a protocol in 2008, the dividend withholding tax rate will be automatically reduced to match a lower rate, including nil, which is provided in a double tax treaty concluded by South Africa after 2008. The South African Tax Court used the same conduit MFN analysis as the Netherlands Supreme Court. A 0% rate is provided 
by the South Africa Kuwait Treaty, which was concluded in 2006. That 0% rate then triggered the MFN provision in the South Africa Sweden Treaty. The MFN provision was included in the treaty by a protocol in 2012. A protocol to a double tax treaty is itself a double tax treaty. Therefore, the 0% rate in the South Africa Sweden Treaty triggers the 0% rate in the South Africa Netherlands Treaty. In Brazil, the government has published a ruling in regard to the deductibility of outbound royalties for the distribution or commercialization of software. The ruling clarifies that the legislative provision which denies a deduction for such payments if made to a shareholder applies only to payments made to direct shareholders of the Brazilian payer. If instead the payments are made to other group members which are not direct shareholders of the Brazilian payer, the no deduction provision does not apply. For a copy of this ruling, please go to our website or app. In the US, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee has approved the protocols with Japan, Luxembourg, Spain and Switzerland, despite Senator Paul's efforts to slow down the process by seeking to add privacy amendments. The next step is for the four protocols to be voted on by the full Senate. Normally, this happens in an abbreviated form by unanimous consent. However, Senator Paul has indicated that he will again try to slow the process down by requiring a formal vote. The other three double tax treaties with Chile, Poland and Hungary were not considered by the committee. Based on previous statements, those treaties will probably require some form of renegotiation with the three respective countries in order to ensure that the beat tax is not susceptible to the non-discrimination article. And also in the US, the Joint Committee on Taxation has released a presentation which provides an overview of the Qualified Opportunity Zone rules which were included in the 2017 tax reform legislation. For a copy of this presentation, please go to our website or app. And now for this week's Treaty Developments. And this has been a slow week. We've had one treaty signed and one protocol signed. I have two articles for you this week. The first article is called the OECD Inclusive Frameworks Program of Work on Revised Nexus and Profit Allocation Rules, Pillar 1. Where will it lead? It's written by Jeff Vanderwalk and Robert O'Hare and is published in the Kluwer International Tax Blog. For a copy of this article, please go to our website or app. Jeff Vanderwalk, of course, was, until July last year, the head of the OECD's Tax Treaty, Transfer Pricing and Financial Transactions Division. A real insider, so to speak. But more importantly, this article gives some good insights on the most important topic in international tax at present. Two important sections are, how did it come to this and where are we headed? In regard to where are we headed, the authors write this on the winners and losers issue. 
The program of work is fairly candid about the fact that a political agreement is needed on the main issues in Pillar 1, that is, new rules on allocating profits to market countries and on jurisdiction to tax remote sellers. Allocation is the most difficult issue because reallocation will create winners and losers from a pure revenue perspective. The size of a given multinational's global taxable profit pie will not change. Rather, the size of the pieces that go to the countries that are able to tax the multinational will change. Some countries that currently get no pieces at all will get a piece of the pie in the future. And some countries will get a smaller piece than they currently get. Why would the losers agree to be losers? Advocates for change hope that the countries that would lose revenue under new allocation rules will be persuaded that it is in their interest to pay that price in exchange for a new international tax framework that is stable, clear and relatively friction free. This is plausible in relation to relatively wealthy countries whose economies are heavily dependent on international trade, such as Germany and the Netherlands, since the political calculation involves the idea that the deal will indirectly provide economic aid to developing countries with large populations, such as India. But for smaller developing countries that depend on multinational corporate income tax revenues from production or extraction activities within their borders, it is hard to see any incentive to agree to new tax rules that reallocate income toward the marketing and sales end of the value chain. The second article is called The New VAT General Reverse Charge Mechanism. It's written by Rita Della Feria and it's published in Kluwer's EC Tax Review. This article starts by considering the history of the so-called missing trader fraud or carousel fraud in regard to VAT in the EU. The major response to this type of fraud has been the introduction of the reverse charge mechanism in regard to specific situations. And a general reverse charge mechanism was approved in late 2018, allowing its temporary application with respect to supplies of goods and services that exceed a certain threshold. In order for a member state to qualify for the application of this measure, a number of objective indicators need to be met, suggesting significant VAT fraud. But the author is not convinced that the general reverse charge mechanism is a good move. She writes, The main disadvantage of a general reverse charge mechanism is that it effectively transforms the VAT into a de facto retail sales tax, RST. VAT, like any other type of tax, is vulnerable to fraud. Traditionally, the inclusion of consumption taxes in the tax mix is seen as spreading the risk of enforcement, and VAT is perceived as less susceptible to fraud than its principal alternative and economically equivalent, the RST. This comparative advantage is attributable to the multi-stage nature of VAT, which requires the tax to be collected on business-to-business -business transactions, but also allows businesses to credit the VAT paid on their purchases, inputs, against the VAT charged on their sales, outputs. On the contrary, RSTs lack the multi-stage collection feature, which essentially means that, one, all of the risk of evasion is concentrated in the last stage of the production chain, 
namely the sale to the final consumer, which is precisely one of the most vulnerable. And two, the third party reporting is limited to that same stage where the buyer has a similar interest to the seller and thus there is a significant risk of, at best, disinterest in the tax element and at worst, the scope for collusion. Responding to missing trader fraud by essentially removing the self-enforceability features of the VAT and effectively transforming it into a de facto RST seems ill-advised, rather like throwing out the baby with the bathwater. A generalised reverse charge mechanism may well kill missing trader fraud, but in the process, it may also give birth to a widespread, more fundamental VAT compliance problem that will be much harder to either contain or combat. Let us hope it does indeed stay temporary. Well, that's the way it is this Friday, the 28th of June, 2019. I'm Steve Towers. Have a great weekend.